Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we are speaking with Nitin Govila. He is a managing director, senior VP of Serge Ferrari, and accredited meditation trainer. Uh, Nitin, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. I was interested uh, in speaking with you because you have this cross-pollination of des both design and meditation, what, what I would consider to be kind of an, um, an objective practice pulling from the subjective, and it seems like you're interacting with the subjective in a spiritual sense through meditation and, and bringing these things together, which is really interesting, a really interesting intersection. Uh, for me to be able to talk to someone about. Uh, Nitin is a manufacturing leader who combines the principles of material design and meditation to create comfortable and sustainable environments. So, uh, and actually just commented, it, it kind of looks like you're in a blimp, uh, and I commented on that humorously, and that actually behind you is one of your projects that your company has worked on. And to start out, I'd like to hear more about that project behind you, honestly. So thank you, Trent, for having me over, um, and thank you for the uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, yeah, so talking about this project, as I was just sharing with you, this is actually a meditation hall uh, of uh, Heartfulness uh, Institute. Uh, Heartfulness is a, a worldwide um, organization which is a system uh, which provides uh, heart-based meditation practices to anybody who's interested. It's provided now you're saying heart-based meditation practice now yes. now is that distinctive from some other type of meditation practice i'm very unfamiliar with meditation practice probably compared to someone like yourself almost completely ignorant so uh what is yeah. the specific heart-based meditation practice yeah. so maybe i'll just complete first this so this uh, meditation hall actually took nearly a year and a two to finish um, it is done by the tensile membranes made by our company, Serge Ferrari. Uh, it could, uh, it's one of the, I would say the largest meditation halls in the world can uh, house around 100,000 meditators at one point of time. So the wow. last big uh, seminar or a group meditation we had in February of 2020, just before COVID struck. And then uh, this year, April 2022, we, we back to starting those big events. So. So that's about this, uh, and we were actively involved with our partners to get this project uh, completed. Uh, now, coming back to this heart-based system, yes, uh, it's unique in its way because um, I'm sure there are many meditation practices which exist. Um, I don't believe in comparing because in the end, each one of us, we find our own journey and find our own connection with, uh, with whatever practice we follow. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are different practices of meditation which exist. Uh, strangely enough, I was only exposed to this, say, 20 plus years back, and I've continued to be with that. So I may be a meditator, but I may not be an expert to compare or compare or do a comparison between different types of practices. So for me, I am I know only this one. Uh, so I think um, I will be only able to comment about the practice I follow. But yes, uh, there are many practices which any anyway, every individual finds their own journey and their own connection. Hmm. See, uh, your statement that um, you you are primarily experienced within the heart based meditation practice, and that that is simply the one that you've been uh, experienced with and have chosen to stay with. But that there's other uh, other valid ways of meditation that are simply different and but still very valid. That's a very un Western religious position or spiritual practice it's it's very it's a contrast to the experience of being in a religious practice in the US that says this is it this is objectively true and this is the only way to do it that's kind of that's interestingly how a lot of western based uh uh religious practice can come across and it's a very it's a very regimented and limited thing, and I don't know exactly why it, it has felt that way for me, but it's very interesting to hear you say uh, with an open mind that this is simply the one that I've been involved with and have stayed with, and there's other valid forms that are very productive in everything else, but this is the one I'm experienced in. That's just a side note. That, for me, is, is pretty interesting to hear that, and uh, it tells me about 
your spiritual practice that that involves this spiritual side and this more objective design oriented side which is very interesting so um can you explain to me a little bit more about heart-based meditation practices why why it would be called heart-based okay so um yeah so uh it's heart based because we meditate on the heart and that's where the name heartfulness meditation comes so uh-huh. it's a practice where we just gently close our eyes we gently bring our attention to our heart with the thought that the source of light uh, is illuminating inside us and is actually pulling us within so mm-hmm. we just try to in a gentle and natural way rest our awareness on our heart without forcing ourselves either to look for a light either to uh, block our thoughts or either to try to concentrate on um, on say the breathing or the heartbeat the whole idea is of meditation should be and that's what we believe that's why we meditate on the heart is that mind is the crux of all issues it's always active it's full of thoughts it's uh, it's always floating between the past uh, or worrying about the future you know it's in in that dif- kind of default mode network always now if so you need a practice where actually you're not using the mind so so if we say concentrate on x or concentrate on y or focus your attention on this that means the moment you say use those words you are bringing the mind into play now if mm. you need to calm the mind you cannot use the mind as a tool to calm itself so you need something else to bring your attention to something more subtle and the closest to being something subtle is your heart and then you do it in a very natural way so if the thoughts mm. also come we just let them pass by we 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 ignore them you know as you would ignore any unwanted guest and if you get lost in a thought you gently can come out of it again bring your attention to your heart and start the uh, practice so what happens is over a period of time as you do regularly and are able to give some amount of time daily you will see that you will automatically slip into meditation without even making any uh, efforts on that sense so that's what the the main essence and the main uh element behind this heartfulness meditation or this heart based meditation is wow that is that is really um something that i have so little experience or knowledge with i have i have no heart or mind wrapped around that uh as a means of understanding it but through what i've struggled to understand and and get a a different perspective on my own practice um i i can complete I've embodied exactly what you're able to articulate. I I tried to do mindfulness meditation practice for a while and every morning I would go and sit in uh my living room and we were renting a house while we were building a house and there would be rats in the or mice in the ceiling that you could hear and uh, that would distract me. I could hear the refrigerator running which was a motor kind of you know human made sound are mechanical and that would distract me and i i just like i could never get past like all of these thoughts just constantly berating me and then one morning it was a september and september here is a nice still warm but still cool at the same time in the morning and i had the window open and here we have a lot of crickets and there was just this little cricket outside and as i was sitting there uh trying to just you know uh be calm and and just be present in that moment i i heard that cricket just kind of a and that that repetitious very natural sound all of a sudden my experience went from one of uh being inseparable to and plastered against what you would see is that massive ribbon of video screens in Times Square in New York City that just stuff moving and like lights and sound and like every that's my mental state constantly and i'm i'm like pressed up against it like against a window but in that moment where i zoomed in on that cricket and i was just listening like all of a sudden it was the weirdest experience my conscious reality went from being plastered onto those jumbotrons with all that information whirling around it just went into the center 
And it was still there, but I wasn't in it or, or controlled by it or stuck in it. I was still able to observe it, but all of a sudden I was just in, in a quieter place with that farther away. And just, I stayed in that moment for probably, I don't know, three minutes it, it, before my mind was like, ah, you know. But it was the strangest thing, and it was just that repetition of that cricket and just letting that moment just kind of be like something, something happened in that moment that changed my conscious state. And I'm, I'm actually doing a lot of writing right now on creativity, which you interact with a huge amount, that, that tells us that when we're, if you can experience something new, you reference more information from your senses than from your memory. But when you're in a, um, a repeated experience, like going to work at the same cubicle or commuting or reentering your house for the millionth time, these things you don't need full sensory perception to tell you about them. You just reference memory and you can allocate your other energies to processing other things. You're less present in that repetitive experience. And I wonder, my, my thought from my position of experience and everything that I've accumulated over time with my culture and everything else tells me, maybe there's something that's somewhat of a connection type of thing between new experience and that brain state of new experience within the, the meditative practice or a prayer practice or something that makes you, that, that focuses you but also unfocuses you from this mental hamster wheel. And that, that there's something, maybe you're, you're in that moment of meditation, you're taking all your memory and saying, why don't you just go over here for now? I'm going to be fully present in a extremely limited experience of trying not to overly think, but actually be overly perceptive just in the presence of that moment. That, there's a lot of complexity there to, to break apart, but that it, it, that's really interesting for you to clarify heartfulness meditation compared to uh, mindfulness meditation. And it makes sense to me as I'm a more experience-oriented person. I'm more open to experience as a means of understanding, which then turns me into having traits of creativity, which can be taught to non-creative people as well. But that that's all very interesting. Thank you for clearing that. And sorry for yammering on and on about that. <laughs> no, no. But, um, uh, what was interesting, what you said um, uh, was that, and you know why it happens because those moments where you were able to hear a cricket or or something or a motor, why was it? Because at those moments, whether it was few minutes or two minutes or three minutes, was that your mental mind was absolutely silent. Your mind mm. was absolutely at rest. So the real meditation actually should be that, right? In the end, what are we looking for? We're looking for peace. We're looking mm. at our mind to be at rest. That does not mean that the function of the mind is reduced or becomes inefficient or whatever. But when the mind is at rest, not only you're able to hear the farthest of noise or the faintest of noise, but a lot of things itself, as you said, comes to you in front of you it's like an it's like an evolution you you wonder you always knew about it but you were not able to you know cross that kind of um, i could say a film uh, to mm. to access it and the moment yes. mind was at rest you accessed it which means that in the end when you talk about creativity and possibly uh, i'm not an expert on that but it kind of exists inside us but because of this clutter of the mind and the activity inside the mind you're not able to access to your inner self where everything does exist your subconscious is recording a lot of things it does exist and you know the subconscious always tries to uh, give you that information to the to the rational part of the brain is through feeling now feeling mm. has no language right. but you are you should be able to perceive that but how will you perceive it only when the mind is at rest so so i think that's the reason also you were able to immediately perceive those things or immediately even hear that noise or feel that burst of creativity in those moments. So yeah, it's, it's so interesting. Like you're based in Singapore, I believe. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. And so 
yeah, I, I need to fly you here to Maine so you can come hang out. I know you're very busy with like building massive things and, you know, okay. But I need to get you here to Maine and come look at my office where I've written. I ha- It looks like I'm a crazy person and I have all this stuff on the walls trying to figure these things out from my cultural experience and perspective of a very westernized, regimented thing. And the things you're saying are things that I've pulled out like emotion like what is emotion it's so incredibly unarticulate but it's so informative and it it is half of what we experience and it seems like when you're born you're fully emotionally present but you lose that over time and but your articulate intelligence grows and somewhere around mm, 40 they kind of cross <laughs> and then you go through maybe this midlife crisis where you're starting to realize like what why, why are my feelings dropping and my, my um, mental state increasing? And I'm able to articulate and do more, but I'm constantly less present under more amounts of stress. Con- like there's this conflict and you have, to rev- you have to kind of work through them as they cross. And it seems like the more Eastern religions have, have this more clarified uh, habitual practice of keeping in touch with this more... Um, ethereal, emotional side as a means of not losing what it foundationally means to be human or something. I don't, and that, it, I, I've come to understand it as foundationally truth and, uh, and love as the most like foundational principles of existence that you then interact with. And, and this, this side of love is the chaos that you use the articulate intelligence to pull intelligence to pull things out of it's also the emotion the subject of the experience but then on the other side you have the object of the facts the truth uh and and the objective things that you can create from the experience and and so that's where this whole thing crosses and why i'm so interested in talking to you because you're actually manufacturing materials and pulling from your belief system, your spiritual practice, and your culture and religion to kind of integrate both the subjective and the objective into a creation that, you know, is is at massive scale behind you, which is really kind of a interesting thing. Now, how what, did you uh, manufacture the materials that are primarily used in that, or did your company design the whole uh, meditation center retreat I'm not exactly compound. I'm not exactly sure what to call it, but did you, was it primarily your materials or were you the designer and uh, designer of materials as well? How did that work? So, yeah. So Search Ferrari is a French company, which has been now, we we will be, um, you know, 50 years old next year. Uh, Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's a manufacturer of composite materials. So we make these membranes and structures and uh, so when we know there's a project, we might work with the architect, uh, help the architect or the designer in or the final client in their vision, in their imagination. Sometimes, uh, you know, there are a lot of thoughts, there are a lot of uh, ideas that architects and designers may have, but we can help them to concretize that either with some kind of design support or also telling them specific elements of the products because composite material, it's a free flowing material. So, mm. so today it's kind of in a way over the years, it's also become the fifth element of construction. And, uh, and now big structures like this, the material itself or the structure itself could, could be with 20, 25 years warranty, but the lifetime of a project could even be 30, 35 years. You know, mm-hmm. um, if you, if you look at Burj Al Arab in Dubai, the, the facades, which is on that building, it's also a uh, tensile membrane made of glass uh, yarns. That's also from our uh, group of company. And it's been there for 25 years. Um, in, the, um, in the Dubai Expo, we, did, we ended up doing 19 structures there or 19 pavilions. Qatar World Cup, which possibly if you love soccer, um, uh, uh, five out of seven stadiums are made of membranes and they are all of uh, our company's material. So mm. the, the fact that uh, people realize that this is a, a good uh, material and there are many grades, you know, so the, they obviously last a long life, long time. But then as a company, we also have to understand what their needs are. Sometimes we help them with some kind of design support if we ha- are able to do so. Otherwise, we'll connect them to the right people or big companies 
big architects would also have design um, centers or uh, departments in their own uh, offices, but they sometimes lack real information on the product. So what they are wanting to concretize, which kind of product can fit into their needs. And then we work together uh, to do that. And then there are partners who specialize in working with softwares, doing the form designing, doing the fabrication, cutting, welding, and installation. So they will source the fabric and then do the structure completion uh, on, on the site. So it's on a big structure like this, it will run over a year and a half or two on a small shading structures or an amphitheater, maybe you can even do the project in six months. So it all depends on the mm. on the complexity of that. In in this type of tensile construction, um, was was the Denver International Airport one of the bigger, one of the first massive scale ones? Yeah, I think that was back in the mid nineties, mid to late nineties. Uh, they had done that, and it was all kind of more conical uh, conical conical yeah, yeah. 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 and yeah. i remember i've been through that airport a few times and it and it's incredibly uh impressive but there's a lot of people at that time that were like oh i don't know about this you know and it's far more common now all over the place it, was that one of the like leading projects at the time for tensile could be could be i i would i must admit that i don't know much about that i also don't know which company did that but yeah. if you're saying chronicle uh, generally, those kinds of shapes would be much more easier to do with membranes. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, over the years, uh, things have evolved. The technology has evolved, and um, and um, and obviously the openness to use those designs. Because one of the things a composite material does is, you can actually give an opportunity to every architect, designer, and final client to create their own signature iconic structure, mm -hmm. whereas classical. Right. Uh, fixed material you don't have too much flexibility to play around with a free flowing material you really can can do that and that's also the reason there's when you look at stadiums airports you know when countries evolve or countries move from say moving in the developing stage to the developed stage in fact when you look at those even the postcards of a country you'll always generally end up seeing a very good airport or a very yeah. nice stadium so they, uh, in that sense, you are able to create a lot of iconic structures um, and that's become the trademark now. Uh, yes, I mean, the the elements of construction will evolve. That's the nature of this industry and companies put a lot on innovation and we also do the same. So as products evolve, as fabrics evolve, as membranes evolve, material evolves, we also keep on innovating so that we are always relevant for this industry as per the needs of the industry evolving. So that's a that's an interesting perspective on that that I hadn't really considered is that the the amount of freedom that you then have with the the form of a building you've you've uh, you've made the skin of the building you've separated it from the structure made it airtight watertight whatever you need it to be tight and you've made it extremely light and separated it. So all of a sudden, the form and the structure are disintegrated, <laughs> not disintegrated, but they're no longer integrated. So your shape that you communicate can become very different from the structure to hold the whole thing up. They still influence each other, obviously, and are created together. But the, the idea, like I'm looking out a window across uh, the parking lot from us here, and this, the building is completely limited by the material it was made from, bricks. So it's got a 90 degree surface, 90 degree corners mostly, and a flat roof. And with this, with this technology now, all of a sudden form uh, is, is kind of independent from, from the, func the immediate function of the structure. And that's interesting because I was reading something uh, about Aristotle a few months ago and his idea of, and I'll butcher it, but he had, he was, uh, I was attempting to read and understand, I should say, uh, his idea that uh, form is an expression of the, of many ways of the, uh, form is an expression of the limitations of your environment, but also the, the, the expression of all the interaction of all the 
the factors going into existence uh, is, is about the best way I can put it. And the interesting thing here is technology is, is helping us um, not be quite so limited by that, which, which is interesting. We do, it, we do that kind of, we're, the U.S., I believe, is currently ideologically separating our truth from our biological truth, a process of like, we can do more if we take this thing that had been uh, uh, completely integrated with our biology, now our, our ideology is moving further away from our biological truth and we're working at understanding how that's going to move forward and the best way to, in the same way, you've taken a, 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 uh, a facade or a structure that was typically structurally oriented and limited to a, pro, uh, a building, and you, you've separated it to a large degree, and you have more freedom in that. But then with any, free, with any new freedom comes issues that you have to stall. You have to you know, deal with the technical limitations or the experiential limitations if it's ideological, whatever. That's, that's a really interesting comparison that my brain just put a bubble around. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, since you mentioned of car parks, I mean, we've uh, we've kind of done many interesting projects even in US, where actually the car park was a standard building, but we have called up also a range of products called facade meshes, where mm. we envelop the building with that, so it not only protects from the sun, you can actually print it. So there's actually a facade building, a couple of buildings done in US. I think one is, I think a FBI building parking space or something else where you are able to keep the privacy, but the view through from the inside is excellent. And you can mm. even print it and play around with it. So not only you are able to create that privacy, but also if you look at a, a classical building, you as a second skin, you're able to create a good uh, environment with thermal and um, and uh, light protection in that sense and, um, mm. and glare protection. Uh, and so you save on energy costs within the building. But at the same time, uh, you are able to give a good view through and even, you know, convert a very old building where instead of taking it down, you actually renovate it to look like absolutely new. So you can play with right. the lighting, you give a good privacy from the inside, but they are still connected to the outside because you don't lose the view through and it's as clear as you can you can get. So, so hmm. there are various elements and people more and more are getting open to experiment with that. Second skin facades never existed. I would say many a uh, few years back now people realize that there's a lot of talk about sustainability and energy but once the heat is inside a building there's there's a limit to what you can do you will still have to use air cons a blind can only protect but the heat is already inside the glass but imagine mm -hmm. if you have something where you can block 80 to 85 percent of the heat outside how much more energy you could uh, conserve and could be very effective for even for the environment. Where I'm at, we simply don't have that problem. <laughs> we're ke we're trying to keep get the heat in and keep it in, <laughs> which I, a lot of times I wish the the you know the issue was reversed. But it yeah that's it's a that's a really um, that's a really uh, like a lot of time I remember seeing a lot of projects that would create a glass skin, and this was back in late late 80s early 90s projects that would have like a glass skin that would keep the water out essentially as all in the wind but then they'd have this different structure inside of it that was completely free and you could do whatever you want and but uh, i really really enjoy uh when a ancient or old or traditional buildings are valued but the new ideas of technology and design they use the the highest capabilities of that to maintain the old, but make it that much better. So taking like a really ancient structure or a very, you know, 100, 200 year old structure, if you're talking US, it's like 200 years, woo. <laughs> but, um, you know, to, to keep a building that's of value and to honor that, but honor it enough to bring it into the current uh, vernacular of, of technology and whatever is possible to say, here's something that we did in the past that helped us get here and we're we're keeping that and we're honoring it by bringing it into the next century and still interacting with it, not just raising it to the ground oftentimes in in the u.s anyways we're just building like big box stores to make as much money as possible and then when they 
lose their ability or the 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 community you know travel patterns change they just raise the building tear it down and and build something else and it it's it's such a wasteful process overall that yeah this this kind of technology i think is is really incredible to to use with it um so the uh, key trends in aesthetic design of office space, commercial, commercial real estate, retail development, airports, stadiums, and hotels. I think we kind of covered that with everything that, that you're doing with able to do with these tensile structures and these new materials. Um, where is, the, where is the, the biggest vacuum that's pulling this technology in currently? Is it mostly airports or is it retail spaces, transportation hubs? Where, where do you see the biggest use of these products currently? Actually, it's a mix of all, but um, I would say more and more it's driven by shading, more and more mm -hmm. it's driven by comfort. So you look at obviously airports, stadiums will be a key element anyway because of the volume of the material which goes into it. But mm -hmm. if I look at more the number of projects, you will, we will, I will talk about more about shading, more about walkways, uh, more about schools where they are covering sports areas, making more things comfortable for everyone. Uh, sometimes big company campuses to make amphitheaters. Uh, so, so people are uh, obviously thinking creatively. And again, that comes to the point that the fact that um, uh, we are able to say that and then talking to them, architects with their experience and what they see also what is available and what has been done, they are also able to realize that they could do something very unique and creative with that. It, it, uh, it is happening. And in some uh, and many of the products, we are also able to offer colors. So that way also makes it easier uh, when you're doing, I mean, a design which may match with a brand color or you are looking for something else. So, mm -hmm. so I think that's uh, that's continued, uh, will continue to drive. Uh, obviously, different countries also have certain rules. Sometimes it's maybe a certain X amount of shading has to be done, a percentage of shading has to be done, which may be by law, depending on it's a very hot place or or whatever, or a UV, when you look, talk about Australia down under and New Zealand. So that's that element which comes over. So yes, um, uh, many things are driving that. So I would say, but these are the still the big ones. And then there's the other element, which is the inside part, because we also have the fabrics for blinds and awnings. So which is inside the building or mm. outdoor living. Outdoor living is also gaining a lot of uh, traction. So then also people also want to play with privacy, but with heat, with protection, also from rain, having their own cozy space. So so whether you want to do outside the window or inside, so that's also really driving uh, the business because people want nice material. Okay, curtains are still the classical one which exists, but mm -hmm. if they can have different options, they're willing to now experiment also. Yeah, I'm actually after after this conversation, I'm heading home to work on a pergola I'm I'm making, which you know, okay. a, essentially yeah. a shade structure. And where where I live here in Maine, we have incredible problems with mosquitoes. So there's going to be mosquito netting uh, on the sides, but on top, I want to have something that just kind of sheds the rain. It doesn't need to be waterproof, but I'd like yeah. it to at least move the water out to the edges. Um, and then shade, but it's going to be temporary that we only use it in the summer. So it needs to come on and off. And I'm probably just going to do like a sun, 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 sail, sun sail. Is that what they call them? Yeah, but yeah. Shade it, sales. We call them shade sales. Shade sales. Okay. Shade. And, and yeah. that's a pretty low technology, um, application or product i'd imagine in compared to what you're using on this bigger scale um yes and no um so it depends on how you want to uh use that application and how complicated it is for example mm -hmm. if you're looking as motorized then obviously you need to not only have a good motorized system but mm -hmm. a good fabric which can roll frequently without right. creating those um curves or lines and which can fold easily and mm. at the same time if you're looking uh, again then the element comes are you looking for translucency are you looking for view through are you okay if the if the raindrops come like a fizz uh, this or you totally want a waterproof so always in membranes there's always that trade-off you will have to do 
you yeah. want a transparency yeah. you lose the view through in a good mm. weather you want a view through you may not have 100% waterproof but you will have those small fizz coming because those micro perforations in the product of what we call as micro uh, meshes they will just create that layer of when the first rain comes and after that it's just a fizz you will feel but at least you will feel nicer you can uh, feel connected to the sky in that sense the view through is there and then there are multiple colors and the product is quite stable and and mm. can last longer so uh, it all depends the technology pergolas in some countries are really fastest growing market because outdoor living now has grown maybe covid also ensured that people have to eat uh, outside not in enclosed environments um, i see that in um, australia i see that in other parts of asia uh, this market growing outdoor restaurants people want to you know create nice spaces rather than the classical fixed awnings you know uh, so, mm -hmm. so and and then as you say they will do a wall which could also be a mesh which could be a a, a permanent fabric could be a translucent one total waterproof again rollable so a lot of uh, elements are happening in the pergola market actually yeah hmm. and if you wish to be connected to someone i'm more than happy to connect with any of our local um, staff to kind of uh, help you out and guide you or connect you with the right people also yeah yeah send me an email i'd love to see the different products that are out there right now that would that would be interesting um and help kind of help me kind of zero in on what i'm going to do <laughs> um so why will the future of work require companies to rethink the role of the office and the environment in which we work this is this is something you had, had noted on on interests and things that you think on that that uh after going through covid i mean it's our work environment has is the biggest evolutionary change that we're dealing with it's just an absurd amount of change in such a short period of time what what are your thoughts on that yeah so um why i would um, i mention that is uh, is is key because i think over the years the element of heat and light and glare has obviously grown and the awareness has grown when you when you design offices or spaces you know uh, whether you want to control light or heat as i just mentioned now whether it has to be outside and inside that's a real good debate which is happening in offices but mm -hmm. i uh, i felt over the years the element which has been missed out and slowly gaining traction now is the acoustics is the sound element within offices Mm. Now, when more and more you work in open offices, right? And I always use a, a differentiation between sound and noise. Noise okay. for me is bad, bad sound in a way that you're in a space that you cannot even hear uh, when you're going to a restaurant, right? I mean, with someone and you go to a restaurant, you cannot even talk across the table. You want to come out to eat, but you cannot even converse properly because there's so much of bad noise. But yeah. if there was a way where this bad noise could actually mean convert to a good sound, meaning you can still converse, you can hear, but you're not, you know, uh, uh, affected by what is going around and the uh, systems are done or the design is done of an office or a space where the sound could be absorbed or does not reflect back or the reverberation speed or the seconds as we measure is reduced, then actually you ensure that you create a comfortable space. And I suppose in working spaces, that will become key because offices are becoming more open in a way as the layout uh, is happening. Uh, so, and one way to attract people back to offices has to be that, that when you come, you don't feel a headache when you finish your day because you have, so many people are talking, so many people are now maybe doing Zoom team or other, other calls that um, they, they feel so much um, heaviness in their head. You know, if you are able to create a good space so not only a balance between thermal element, heat, light, uh, glare, but also bringing the acoustic element to it. I suppose that would really create a full, comfortable working space for everyone. So you can actually use these membranes that are typically, in my experience, used on the exterior. You can use them on the interior as ways of deadening uh, sound transmission, even just in stretching that fabric in that way. It, you can, but there are already, we at least as a company, we make fabrics which are for acoustics. We okay. call them acoustic fabrics with an alpha factor of 0.65, which means that the uh, 
um, the value nrc value the way you measure the noise reduction coefficient because people mm. misunderstand sometimes the mistake they make with acoustic they always talk about decibels but decibel is a relative word decibel depends on how many people are there how, how the room or the space is used because mm. if you could have the best uh, soundproof material but in the end if you have a lot of people the effect obviously changes so what you really need is the way to measure the material is the noise reduction coefficient and mm. we have products in fabrics which are the highest in the category obviously you are not comparing to something like a rock wool or a foam which are related to soundproofing but here we mm -hmm. are saying for acoustic comfort so we have fabrics like that which also are flexible you can use it for ceiling you can do use it as baffles you can use it as blinds you can even cover the lighting and nobody can say that it's covered by a fabric so you can put it at those places where they will not affect the eye they they kind of integrate with the design of the room or the office or anything and that's what we've done in our head offices and offices across the world and you you immediately feel the effect you it's i mean somebody who's without that and somebody's with that they will be able to tell the difference so yes it, uh, we have that yeah it's it sounds like uh going down the road in a car that has no sound deadening compared to a car that has sound deadening and what i've experienced this like uh kids here in the us will take a car and they'll strip everything out of it so it's light as possible so it can be fast and fun you know but if you get in those cars you hear the transmission you hear the motor you hear the tires you hear the like everything and it's it's too much but then when you ride in a car like a really luxury car that has a lot of sound deadening and everything else you're just in this just this just Space. you know you're like in a calm quiet soothing you know it's it's that to me it's it's weird like i was telling you about how you have your full emotion and no articulate intelligence and they cross at middle age and i as a kid i sought out um constant stimulation and now that i'm this age i'm looking for more so that ability to be reflective and process everything i've experienced to to actually make headway which is yeah, so I, I I need to get a bunch of your material and plaster it all over my house because yeah, I have you, two you boys. Can, you <laughs> can do that, make it as a blind ceiling, and it will just integrate with the aesthetics of that. And I suppose what happens with sound is, unfortunately, it's always assumed when it's sound and acoustics, you, you think about soundproofing. We are not mm. talking here about soundproofing. You're talking about to have a good sound, a, a comfortable working space. And that's why I say acoustic comfort not acoustic mm. you know reduction or whatever because it could be misconstrued you're not looking for a recording room per se you're looking yeah, for a space yeah. where uh, you feel comfortable the noise does not the bad noise does not affect you and i think that's where sometimes this element gets ignored because mm. either also there are very few experts which exist in the industry but now there are more and more who are coming in this field uh, and i do foresee that um, having giving them choices will help them also to look at you know designing those elements uh, in the offices or homes or or mm -hmm. individual uh, working areas to the to the point that you're saying this difference between soundproofing and kind of more engineering the acoustics of a space and and making it a comfortable beneficial acoustic experience yes. if you soundproof an environment uh if you've been in those which i'm sure you have they can be extremely disorienting because you have no feedback or reference and it's the weirdest thing. So like what you're saying is you control it and you design it to be a comfortable and, and a clean feedback uh, in experience so you can get a clear understanding of your environment rather than elimination of one stimulus in an environment. Because if you have that one stimulus or sense completely eliminated, it becomes one less leg to stand on, I guess, in that in that situation. And, and it's not only about working spaces. We've done numerous projects of um, sports, enclosed sports areas, like sports um, um, halls in schools or colleges mm -hmm. where they play basketball or any other sports. You look at enclosed swimming pools. Swimming pools have a lot of noise. But oh, yeah. if actually below the roof, if you put a 
fabric which is an acoustics one it changes amazingly one so nearly one, it reduces everything by two thirds in terms of the reverberation sound and the effect is amazing mm. we've done so many small uh, sports areas in new zealand in france in japan um, and it it really changes everything and the fact that it's lightweight in a country like japan which is a earthquake prone country you also are able to lightweight but also heavy you're able to protect the roof if it collapses in case of a very heavy earthquake and if mm. uh, children are moving to a sports area for protection when an earthquake comes it actually gives another level of protection you know so so in that sense so 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 that way i mean uh, it's it's it really changes the perspective and um, generally now more and more when we see good designs and when they're looking at sports areas or at least the enclosed sports areas it's becoming a key element either they want double skin as two membranes again for the purpose of acoustics because they want to do that or at the same time they will say one uh, top membrane and below that i need an acoustic in fact in this meditation hall itself we have mm -hmm. a heavy duty acoustic membrane which has been put and which has really been very effective to reduce the echo because it's a total open space uh, and there are pillars only on the side so it's a total open area uh, in in that sense so so having that membrane put beneath that roof ensured that the echo was really reduced to a larger extent yeah i would imagine a an extremely large uh gathering a uh, spot that's not like a sports arena where there's like a cheering aspect, but more so potentially a single person trying to communicate effectively with a group. That's a real uh, acoustic issue that, that you need to deal with. And then also as a place of mass meditation, you're, you know, you're, you can close your eyes, but the audio is always going to be there. So if you can control that, yeah, great point. <laughs> Uh, how do you combine the principles of material design and meditation to create sustainable environments? This is an interesting question to me. It is. It is. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, but um, uh, um, because, you know, I mean, in the end, I'm not the one who's uh, who's kind of um, uh, designing these structures and everything. But um, what I can say is that um, I would more connect it to the wellness of people, the wellness of workspace. So in that sense, uh, and in fact, COVID has kind of uh, activated it much faster that there's a real push towards wellness and well-being. I mean, in the last two years in COVID times when I was working from home virtually and everything, I've done so many meditation sessions for corporates who were also people working from home that uh, i mean there was obviously a different level of stress and everything um and um and that really you know has becoming a part of things now even when things have opened up so i think uh, that element that people also realize that now more and more they need to give some space within offices also and many companies i'm seeing that some are creating meditation pods some are creating rooms where people whoever whatever faith they believe in can go there take their time, sit there alone. And if they want to meditate, they meditate. If they want to pray, they pray. So so in that sense. So I think that's an element I'm seeing more and more that uh, that alertness, that sensitivity is coming in terms of design of spaces that it's always good to give people those moments in a day if they wish mm. to, where they can kind of either connect with their selves, connect with their inner selves or whatever they would wish to do, and then mm. come back uh, rejuvenated um, in, in the work uh, area, you know, so so that's, I would say more in that sense, uh, obviously being sensitive to that in meditation, if you're there, you're more sensitive to those elements. Mm -hmm. If you're not, obviously, then um, uh, sometimes it becomes uh, difficult for people to understand. But I think overall, uh, there's a more general awareness on wellness and well-being and people realize oh, yeah. some element of this where people can connect with themselves and have a space for themselves even in office times or in office areas, uh, makes a lot of sense, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, I think especially in America, there's a huge push right now. I'm sure in other countries it's been going on for a long time. I think we're a little late on the game of of really understanding or, or we've had such an objective religious history, one that's far more tr uh, conservative, traditional and and 
certainty based that we're we're experiencing a large loss of religious belief but people who still maintain spirituality and bringing that understanding of still being connected spiritually in some way to how does that benefit uh, a worker or someone within a creative environment or management environment any of that you know the this kind of disentangling of religious practice and and work but also reentangling them to a to a large degree of of actually having these like meditation rooms or anything else i think we're we're starting to understand that that you can you can lose uh, a regimented or a, a belief or or spiritual practice um but it comes at a cost and then kind of processing the the reasons why you would lose it but reintegrating the beneficial practices and traditions um and it's easier once you leave something that you're familiar with to embrace similar things but of a different culture because you you leave something behind that you felt was limiting you so you're more open to the new thing that maybe provides the same thing that you had in the past but comes within a different name and comes from a different culture so you don't have the baggage to to not accept that so i think there's there's a there's an awakening uh, within our culture of embracing these kind of things, meditation rooms and and more spiritual awareness. And it comes with all the odd things of, you know, watching a child learn to walk. We're going through this thing of, you know, in many ways, a very awkward thing at times of the the cultural cla- clash of of growing spiritually as a nation while at the same time losing religion. It's a it's a very uh, it, it's a very ungangly process at times, which is funny, but whatever. <laughs> um, last question I have for you. I know you're probably, you're probably late in pretty late in the day over there in Singapore right now. Imagine. Yeah. It, it, it I mean, um, uh, it would be touching 10 PM. Uh, so oh my, I'm sorry for keeping you up so late. No, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's no problem. I understand. I mean, we have to uh, manage that anyway. I mean, it's, it might, it's also early for you. So, so in that sense, yeah. Yeah, Singapore is one of my places on my bucket list. I I believe I've gone through the airport there, but that's about it. <laughs> okay. okay. I need I need to get there someday. Um how mindfulness workspaces are conductive to deep work and productivity. So when when uh when we're talking about deep work, what what does that mean to you and how does a mindfulness uh practice interact with a work uh environment that provides for deep work and productivity in your opinion? So I, as I, I, I won't be able to say much on the, on the mindfulness element part of it, but I suppose if I take it as a broader word of, of meditation, again, yes, whatever yes. somebody practices, whether mindfulness, heartfulness, or any other meditation practice, I suppose right. um, it connects to what we were just talking about that um, the element that you are able to connect yourself is, is also kind of a self journey for you. So in that sense, um, uh, when people are in that work uh, space, I think they are able to reflect uh, much more and much deeper on how they interact, how they work, how they communicate, how they, you know, take sometimes a space and, you know, take a decision or, uh, you know, uh, work on certain things, which may sometimes be either controversial or difficult, but uh, how they are able to take a good balanced uh, approach to to things rather than being conditioned by uh, biases or whatever. I think that itself gives a different perspective of working. It creates a, a fair workspace, I would say, uh, a nice workspace and a and a space where you f- you would feel you're creating the right environment for people to be comfortable, you know, people mm. to be comfortable to express have, at the same time not feeling either afraid or worried or anything in that sense. So it, it also creates a more open sharing space. And I think mm-hmm. that in the end, it boils down to everyone because, you know, I mean, as any change in society, it has to be starting with ourselves as we as individuals. Sometimes we fall into that trap that oh things have to change, but it has to change for your neighbor or somebody <laughs> opposite you, not, but not for you. But actually the yeah, real change yeah. can only happen from yourself from uh, oneself and then it's like a ripple of a water when you throw a stone those ripples spread so it goes from one person to the next to the next and then you're able to expand the the surroundings uh, around you and those concentric circles which you can create 
so i think mm. um no matter what you believe in or what somebody does that taking out that space or time or to be able to do something on that really changes i suppose an individual uh, in a workspace that um, yeah. that i've seen for myself also uh, and environments and it does make a lot of difference i think there's a a similar principle or rule that i've run into uh i i'm not a natural writer by any stretch but i'm currently trying to write on creativity for a article and uh the things i've read have said don't ever attempt to write beyond like focused writing beyond like two hours it just becomes a, a, just a log jam you have to get up get away from it do something physical something maybe a meditation practice like something let your mind rest let it clear out and come back to it later you'll have processed it and everything else and hey there's there's so much embodied wisdom in all these practices and and these religious uh practices and spiritual practices that a lot of times people like myself who've rejected what they grew up in uh cast it all out and they don't realize that there's practices within there that are actually highly beneficial even if they're not um certainly or or uh, specifically true in the way that you associated with them previously the practice of those traditions the practice of those habits um they they have truth in them regardless and you know meditative practice spiritual practice praying they're all of a of cut of the same cloth that is attempting to get at purpose meaning reason that that we exist and and bringing those together and when you're when you're more integrated uh, in within moderation i think that you just simply become more effective you get deep work done and your productivity goes up so why not do that and and it's so interesting i just saw a thing uh went through my feed that uh in japan culturally in japan if you're seen taking a nap at work what it tells your manager or someone else is that holy cow they are working so hard they fell asleep at work if that happens in america you're caught sleeping at your desk boy you you the Bye. first thing you have to do you have to go amen sorry what <laughs> you have to pretend that you were praying you know it's it culturally it's so different and and there's so much going on there but we can learn so much from each other and it's just such an interesting conversation so i really appreciate you taking the time i'm sorry we kept you up so late but um thanks for reaching out i really appreciated this conversation you've you've helped outline some things from from a really great very different perspective that i don't have and i really appreciate that thank you for sharing Thank you for the work you're doing and sleep well. <laughs> oh, thank you Trent and really a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed that and I hope to remain connected with you and I'll also kind of send you an email to I mean if you wish to discover something more about the products or whatever and I'm more than happy Absolutely. If you wish to get a flavor of a of a meditation session as I'm also a meditation trainer with heartfulness I can take you through virtually to a session over 30 minutes if you wish to just experiment once if you Nitin wish. Govila thank you so much for taking the time look forward to talking to you again absolutely thank you Trent thank you again and have a great day